We have everybody out today and our visitors. We welcome you and uh, hope you enjoy the uh, morning service. The uh, topic I've chosen to uh, speak on today, or what I should say is what the Lord led me to speak on, is in the book of James. So if you have your Bibles, could you please turn to the book of James? James chapter 5. Now this was uh, triggered off by a meeting there with Jean and uh, Helen. And uh, we had a get-together about, I guess, a month or a month and a half ago. And we were discussing this passage of Scripture, and uh, it produced a little bit of problem. And I didn't have an answer, and uh, all we could do was just conjecture, shoot back and forth and say, well, I think it says this, I think it means that. So it encouraged me to study it and see exactly what God had to say. James is a very interesting book. It was the actually the first epistle written back in the early church and the writing was approximately 45 to 50 AD James being the brother of Jesus Christ or if someone to call him the half brother but in any case he was one who was instructed by the Lord to take care of the Jewish people and if we <clears throat> look at James verse or 1 1 we find that he is writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad and he gives them greeting and uh, just to reinforce the fact that he was writing to the Jewish Christians, when we look at chapter 2, verse 2, well, let me see if I got this right. It says, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring, etc., etc. The word that's commonly found in the New Testament for assembly is ecclesia, or the called out ones. But at this point, the Greek word that's used is synagogue, and that synagogue was actually the meeting place which started roughly around uh, 400 or 300 BC for the Jewish people. When they had lost their temple, the synagogue came into being where they could meet, and actually it's obscure as to its exact origin. But in any case, the synagogue was a meeting place for Jewish people. Now this is uncommon in the New Testament to find synagogue used for the assembly of believers. But do remember now, James is writing to Jewish Christians. You know, there's a problem today with Bible interpretation and Bible study. And the problem is not, I guess, on the uh, individual Christian's part. It's on the fact that we have barriers that separate us from really uh, trying to get down to the ground facts of who wrote the book, where he wrote the book, and uh, what was the main intent of the book. There's language barriers. Hebrew in the Old Testament with a bit of Aramaic, and at the same time Koine Greek in the New Testament, and when you find, uh, when you start interpreting from one language to another, you tend to lose sometimes the exact meaning, and sometimes you just cannot um, outrightly translate it properly, because, for instance, we don't have certain modes or voices that the Greek language would have. So that produces a lot of problems, and especially in the book of James. If you've heard of the age-old problem of faith and works in James chapter, or chapter 2, where they say that it contradicts Paul's writings, well, there's no problem if we can understand exactly who's writing and who he's writing to. Besides, Paul hadn't written his letter to the Romans or the Corinthians yet, so James was not trying to outdo his brother in the Lord. They actually don't contradict each other, they complement each other. In the uh, part we're going to look at, in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18, we find again that the language barrier is going to help us as, as we look at the original language as to the proper interpretation. And not only that, but customs, customs. Uh, historical evidence and archaeology has uncovered many findings that has enhanced, if not uh, clarified, many problems within the New Testament writings. So there is a problem when it comes to Bible interpretation, but they can be overcome. Now, in this point, we're dealing with uh, prayer, because you are going to find in verses 13 through 18 the word prayer is mentioned eight times. Now, you'll find it seven times as pray or prayer or prayed, but in verse 17, the word earnestly, prayed earnestly, the word earnestly is again a uh, translation from a Greek word prosuke, which means prayer. So that's where we can get the eighth uh, point of prayer. You know, man has had many powers. If you can look back to the early ages, man started with what other power but manpower itself. But as he progressed... He started getting into horsepower, and finally they get into dynamite, and then into TNT, and now atomic power. You can imagine the feats of man as he increases in his strength. But there is one power that man cannot compete with, 
And that's prayer power. And you know something? As a Christian, I have to look and question myself. Do I utilize this power that God gives me? Prayer power. Because prayer has changed many a situation. Altered nations. Prayer. Because the almighty hand of God was involved with the affairs between the Christian and his prayer. Now, at this point, I believe a good uh, outline for this would be in verse 13, we have prayer for the suffering. Verses 14 through 16, we have prayer for the sick. And then finally, 17 and 18, we have an example of prayer. If you just walked in, it's James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. Now, we'll look at this uh, just one at a time so we can see exactly what James is trying to say. Verse 13, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Now let's look at that for a second. Uh, the entitlement is prayer for the suffering because the word afflicted comes from a compound word, kakos patheo, which means evil sufferings. Now do remember, Paul is, or pardon me, James is writing to who? The 12 Jewish tribes which were scattered abroad, but 12 Jewish Christians. They were Christians. And in the early church, especially at this writing, we find that persecution was prevalent. We have the first persecutions recorded in the early chapters of the book of Acts, which is the beginnings of the church. So James is saying, listen, what are you going to do when you suffer? And let me tell you, those people knew what suffering was all about. Let me just back up a minute in the book of Hebrews. Now, Hebrews, again, was a book that was directed to Jewish Christians. In Hebrews 11:24, it says... By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now, if there's ever an example in this chapter or chapter 11 the hall of fame of uh, saints of the old testament moses gives us a good example he had access to riches he had access to living a leisurely life but what did he choose he chose rather to suffer affliction let's parallel that today do i choose to live an easy life where i can just slip around with the world or should i choose the path that moses chose we should be questioning ourselves and suffer affliction with the people of God. Now, we're not being martyred today in our, in our uh, continent, although I do believe in the other continent, which I know nothing about. Christians are really suffering, even up to the point of death, for the faith of Jesus Christ. So I cannot relate to exactly what the suffering was. Sometimes we tend to lose exactly what's happening to people because it's so easy to say a word. Well, they're suffering in Russia, you know. But suffering involves an individual, and an individual that's suffering is in hardship. Now, here's the Jews just coming to the Lord, and it's no different today than it was back then. Because when a Jew gets saved today, he is kicked right out of society, the Jewish society. He is ostracized completely from them. In fact, from, from what somebody told me, they have a funeral because they figure he is just as good as dead. And he, his, all his family relationships and everything is completely cut off. And let me tell you something. That's suffering, affliction for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can't compare it because I never suffered that type of affliction. Although maybe some of us can say, well, you know, our families turned against us and some of our friends turned against us. Well, that's affliction. So what does James say to do? If you're afflicted, pray. He's not saying, please pray. That's a command. And by the way, there are six imperatives, six commands within these few verses of scriptures. They are speaking with authority. And I believe we can call it a command or an imperative of entreaty with a sense of urgency or request. Listen, if it's coming, if it's happening to you, pray. That's the power that's going to help you. Notice he doesn't at that point promise deliverance. There's no magical formula saying, boy, if you do this, it's going to be over. No, because affliction seems to be part and parcel of a Christian life. Remember the verse? For it's appointed unto everyone not only to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. We're to suffer for his sake. 
So it's part and parcel with the word of God. Look in verse 10. Back up a few verses. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. And we have many examples again of the prophets. But let me just at this point read uh, again Hebrews 11 verses 35 through 40. It says, Women received their dead race to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tested, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having received witness through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Notice they did not receive the promise. Do you know what he's trying to imply? That's not saying that they didn't get the reward, but they did not see what they were looking for. They were looking for a kingdom. They were looking for a city. They had their eyes peeled on that one direction, but they never saw it. They all died along the way. But God promised them a better resurrection. God promised them better promises than the world. And you know, as I was uh, studying the Old Testament there the other day, I was looking at the minor prophets. Uh, some of them people, they just never understood God. God chasing the Jew all the way down through history. And finally, after the 70-year captivity, when he brought them back, do you realize that if you read, I believe it's the book of Ezra, only 50,000 Jews returned back, and then it says the rest of them stayed? Because they enjoyed having fellowship and progress and getting ahead with the Gentile nations. You see what happens? They didn't choose affliction, did they? If only they would have known or if they only would have heeded the word or watched some of their leaders that God had set forth for them, that if they would have suffered affliction now, they would have blessings eternally. And not only that, but God says, here's the remedy. Pray. Pray. Not saying you're going to be delivered, but pray that God's will might work in your life. Now, let's look in the other side. He says, not only if you're afflicted, but look, is any Mary, let him sing psalms. That's the other side. God does not just promise us a morbid Christian life. We have fellowship one with another. We have our little get-togethers, and it's just great to visit Christians, to get along. Uh, I've, uh, this week I've met new Christians at a, a church in town, and it's just great to see the old zeal and, you know, just moving ahead for the Lord. They don't know where they're going. They don't, know the, they don't understand the Word of God, but they're happy. They're happy. And what does God say? Sing psalms. Praise one another. Uh, I had a reference here. In Colossians 3.16, let me just read it. In Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I like that spiritual songs. I think that would just about uh, omit a lot of the so-called Christian rock and all these other so-called forms of music that are supposed to be worshiping God. It would just omit them. Because God says, you do it in a spiritual song. Not the way you want to do it, do it my way. There's a big difference later when we start singing church hymns than when you start listening to some, well, whatever you call it, Christian rock. But then there's controversy on it. I've had many arguments with the young people over it, and I came out of the rock set, and I'll tell you, it's just not God-honoring music. It isn't. God demands separation. But anyway, let him sing psalms. So that's what God is trying to tell us. And by the way, your fellowship with Christians plus maturity in the Word of God is going to deliver us from a lot of affliction. A lot of people walk around moping. I've seen it on the job in the steel plant, you know, and boy, I know he's a Christian, but nobody else would as he sits there and he's defeated and saying, I hate my job and the guys I work with. Utilize your time properly. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. <laughs> and you're not, a, you know, you're not the salt of the earth when you're sitting there groping and mumbling and complaining. That is not what God wants. We have to question ourselves whether we, we're doing it God's way or not. And by the way, how did James start off this epistle? My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. James 1, 2. Count it all joy when you fall into those trials. God is trying to work. God is trying to mold us. And it's unfortunate, but the molding comes through chastening too. And chastening we don't like. 
but it's supposed to perfect us. It qu makes us question ourselves, and it makes us draw closer to him. Remember Paul and Silas in the book of Acts? They were thrown in jail, beaten for the cause, and <laughs> what did they hear them doing? Singing psalms, rejoicing, praying. Boy, I would have hated to have been the unsaved guard that had to stand by his cell, listening to the word of God continually, saying, what are these guys, crazy? No, they're Christians, and they're living for the faith, and they're, and they're praying, and they're happy under the... Uh, persecution that they were putting them under now that's verse 13 prayer for the suffering now let's look at verses 14 through 16 because this here has been a problem passage since the beginning of writing of this and uh, it's caused uh, a lot of problems with different churches it's uh, brought in articular confession group confession uh, faith healers use it everybody's using this passage of scripture to suit their own fancy let's see what God has to say verse 14 is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. We'll stop there and we'll continue after. First of all, we find he's saying now, is any sick among you? This word sick uh, is a Greek word, osthenes, which means weak. But I have a book here that uh, Jean lent me. I didn't say it gave me, because I know you want it back. <laughs> and it's written by a doctor. And I enjoy what he says, but I'm not too sure that he is right when it comes to the point of this word, uh, asthenes, or weakness. He omits the fact that this passage could be speaking of physical sickness. But we know that physical sickness and weakness go hand in hand. When I'm weak, I'm sick, or when I'm sick, I'm weak. And what an awful feeling it is. And uh, this word is translated many times, weakness in the New Testament, but it is also translated sick. And we can't omit that fact. He tries to use that to omit anything to do with physical healing. But I tend to disagree. I believe that this person who is being plagued here is sick. And it could be the result of physical sickness, or it could be the result of spiritual sickness causing weakness in a person's life. Is any sick among you let him call for the elders of the church again the responsibility is for the individual and you know something that's not practice today i was talking again to pastors in town over this passage and nobody does it scripturally nobody does it tells you there if you are sick now we're going to see what he mean by sick let him call for the leadership the elders of the church note it's not the elders that are blamed for not calling around now you know you don't want to sit there and are you sick today? Uh, you know, keep calling around. That's not how it's done. We don't know who is sick. But if the person is sick, and I believe this passage is dealing with a person that cannot get to the assembly. He cannot get there. Sickness has, let's say, bedridden the individual. <clears throat> the individual and the responsibility, he says, let him call. Again, it's not asking. It's a command in the Greek language. You call the elders because that's your God-given responsibility as Christians in the body of Christ. Now you think about it. Any sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray. Notice in verse 13, are you afflicted? You pray. All of a sudden we have a reversal. Is any among you sick? Let them call for the elders and let the elders do the praying. Now let's not put all the responsibility on the elders because who do the elders represent? They are merely representing the church as a whole group. So they have taken the responsibility, like we have prayer lines where the women pray, etc. But if it comes to a point where a person requires or requests to have the elders present, they're to be present. And they're to pray for the individual over what's wrong with them. Notice he's not asking for a faith healer. Notice they're not asking for a doctor. And by the way, who wanted to ask for a doctor back in the early centuries? Because medicine was at a very low ebb. I mean, they didn't have the progress or the progress that they have today in the field of medicine. And if you remember Luke 8:43, the woman that had the issue of blood, man, she gave all she had, and she still wasn't cured until Jesus Christ cured her. So it was very expensive in those days to have someone come and look at you if you were sick. <clears throat> now, also, let's not neglect the fact that sickness is not only caused by, let's say, sin in your life. Now, again, this is what this individual deals with. He says, well, this person's sick mainly because of sin. Well, let's hold it a minute. Was Job sick because of sin? 
Was Job uh, put down in bed? No, he was a righteous man. And when his three buddies, if you want to call them buddies, came and said, Boy, Job, you're a bad man for God doing this to you. And his wife said, Job, you better deny that God because look what he's done to you. No, he was suffering righteously. Remember in the book of Philippians, Epaphroditus, I believe it's Philippians 4, was near unto death for the gospel for the work of the faith. And he was angered because he found out people were praying for him because he wanted their prayers directed for somebody else. He was a righteous man, physically sick because he was doing the job that God wanted him to do. So sickness is not yet a direct result of sin. Remember the young, uh, who was it, the boy? Who sinned, him or his parents? Neither. You see, it wasn't a specific sin that caused this little boy to be sick at that time in, in the early church. It was just generally the sin nature that brought sickness upon them. But it also said that the God may be glorified by it. <clears throat> now, in this case, we have the sick person calling the elders, and the elders of the church come, and they pray over him. Now, here's where we get a little pro a problem. A lot of people think, well, we have to lay our hands on the individual, and we have to be over that individual in order that he may be healed. I disagree. First of all, uh, just looking back at the original language, there's three constructions that are used with a preposition epi. If it's used with one construction, it means touch. If it's used with the accusative construction, it means just general direction. And that's the one that is used here. Pray over him is not implying that you have to be over top of the individual touching him. Otherwise, God in the original text would have said, pray with the, you know, with the genitive of the description, bingo. Then you'd have to lay your hands on him or you have to have physical contact with the individual. That is not what he is saying here. He's just saying, listen, <laughs> what are you doing there? The elders are going there for the sole purpose of praying for that individual. You don't go there and start praying around the world or praying for your, your needs or somebody else's needs. Your prayers, along with the prayers of the church that is backing you up, is centered on that individual. You tell them that. That's a, that's a very It would be a very cons a good consolation for an individual to know that, wow, this is just for me. That would be a real, I think, upturn in that sick person's life. Today, many uh, people do practice that, where they say you have to lay your hands on. Well, then it's unscriptural, because even when we get into the laying on of hands that's mentioned in the other portions of Scripture, let's remember now, there's customs, and that one of the customs the Jews had was that they would lay their hands on one another for the purpose of transfer of authority or uh, some appointment to office or whatever the case may be. But that was a Jewish custom. We don't do that today. We don't greet one another with a holy kiss. We shake hands. I don't know if I want to kiss Jim with a beard anyway. <laughs> but the point is, our customs do change. Our customs change, and we have to remember that. Now, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. First of all, anointing might give you the, the improper sense. It's not anointing as a constant process. It's an aorist tense verb. It's meaning having anointed. In other words, something's already been done before you uh, pray with the individual. This is interesting. Um, many today overemphasize the formality of the oil. My question is, what, what kind of oil are we going to use today? I mean, we have a choice between Mazzola oil or 10W30. I mean, you see, like, it's just like you can get into so many uh, complications if you want to hold this. Listen, Matthew 9:29, a blind man was healed. Christ touched him. No oil involved. Matthew 8:15, Peter's wife's mother was healed. Christ touched her. No oil involved. Mark 7.34, deaf and dumb man healed. Christ put his finger in his ear and Christ spat and touched his tongue. No oil involved. Luke 22.51, servant's ear was healed. Christ merely touched him. No oil involved. Luke 5.13, the leper was healed. Christ just touched him and that was it. You see, oil was not consistently used. Well, what's going on here? Why oil here? Oil has many uses in the Old and New Testament. Oil has been used, number one, for cosmetics by Jews. They used to use it after baths so that they could smell good. Number two, it was used to light lamps, and we've seen this in the tabernacle in the Old, uh, you know, back in the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament usage in their customs. Oil was used to anoint dead bodies. And I believe that was just so they could smell good because they didn't have, I don't believe, the, the processes we have today of embalming and preserving a body for a long period of time. Oil was also used to coronate kings as a Jewish custom. 
It was used figuratively as a symbol of endowment with the Holy Spirit for the duties of office uh, which were given to the individual. Now, this was just, again, a custom back then. We find in Luke 7.46, oil was used as a greeting between Christ and a woman, where she anointed his head and his feet with oil. Now, that was one use of oil that I believe would be could be used in this case, but let's not neglect the fact that it also had a medicinal use. Medicine. There's a person who has recorded, his name was Celsus, of using oil applied externally with friction to break fevers. Applied externally with friction to break fevers. <clears throat> Josephus, a historian who lived around the time of Christ, spoke of Herod being bathed in oil for the same purpose. And we find Isaiah used oil in medical treatment back in the book of Isaiah. So oil had its use back then. I was talking to a nurse there not too long ago, and she said, you know, they're finding out that people today that use olive oil, uh, they're having, let's say, if they rub it in the palms of their hands, etc., you know how you do the, I don't know what you use for creams, but they're finding they're having less uh, swell in their joints, etc. So I don't know how you know valid that is. So don't everybody start looking for olive oil. But the thing is, oil had its purpose as a medicinal use. And to reinforce that, he says, having anointed him with oil, there's two Greek words for anointing. One is creo, which means ceremonial anointing, which was actually a sacred ritual. And the second one, which is the one that's used here in the book of James, is alepho, which means rubbing or massaging. Do you see what's going on? The elders come to the house. God says, I'm not only going to supply a heavenly remedy, I'm going to also at the same time supply an earthly. Do you see the balance? He says, you get over there and you pray for that individual, but at the same time, you've already anointed him with oil in the name of the Lord. You see that? How many people today, I remember there was a bunch of people years ago down south that wouldn't take polio vaccinations. Hey, we have Christ living in us. We don't need that. They were starting to get polio until I guess the government overrode their decision. That's imbalance and how we tend to draw imbalance today. <clears throat> what God is using here is a divine means, which is what? Prayer. Eh? The power of prayer. And at the same time saying, listen, don't neglect the earthly means. Now, when I get sick today, the first thing I do is I call a doctor. Now, I should say, you pray about it, but you do call a doctor because God has supplied the doctor and the medicines and the exploration that's going on and the knowledge that man is using. That's from God. God's omniscient. He's all-powerful and all-knowing. He's given us the availability to use medicine, but at the same time, don't neglect prayer because God still works miracles today. You cannot deny that some people are miraculously healed. You cannot deny that, but it's only if God wills it. Verse 15, notice, and the prayer of faith. Notice it doesn't say the oil. <laughs> it doesn't say the oil or any manner of whatever you're going to do, if you're going to lay your hands, whatever. And the prayer of faith, he says, shall deliver the sick. What is the prayer of faith? Number one, faith is not demanding from God something that we want. As if to say, God, you owe me how many preachers get on TV and say, if you only had more faith, brother, if you had more faith, faith will heal you. Faith will not heal you. Faith will not heal you. You are then jumping into the sovereignty and the omnipotence of God. God is the one that does the healing. We just inquire by faith. That's the story. Faith is response to the revealed will of God. Thy will be done. It doesn't say my will be done. It's thy will be done. And besides that, in this verse 15, he says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. That word save is the same word used for you must be born again, like saved. But it also has the meaning of what? Deliverance. Isn't that the case? The meaning of deliverance. What he's trying to say is, listen, this prayer, which is of faith. Now remember, it's not a demand for God. It's asking God, searching out his will. He says, you know what that'll do? That'll deliver the one that's sick. See verse 14, is any sick among you? Osthenes, any weak among you? We have a different word here now. And the prayer of faith shall save the kamo. It's a different word. I said it wrong. Kamno. It's a verb in a present participle form, which implies that the one is in a state of being sick. But listen, 
That word has within itself the meaning of to be weary as from constant work, but it implies not weary, uh, weariness physically, but weariness of mind caused from the sickness. Do you see what God's trying to say? God does not guarantee through the prayer of faith that he's going to deliver the person physically. You might remain sick. What he is guaranteeing is I shall deliver you mentally from the anguish of being sick. And that's what that word implies. To be weary from the sickness. Your, your mind, you know what it's like when you get sick, you get down, everything's just going wrong. God says, I'll deliver that. And he will do it. But don't think at that point you're going to jump out of a wheelchair or you're going to jump out of bed. That's not what God guarantees. He guarantees the mind having a relaxed... Uh, what is that? Let me think of that scripture. Where he says, if any... Um, I'm trying to think of a scripture here and I'm lost. Oh yes, the peace of God. He says the peace of God. The world doesn't give you that peace, but God can. But that again doesn't guarantee that you're going to be delivered out of jail miraculously like it happened in uh, the book of Acts in the early church when the bar, you know, the doors just flew open or that you're going to be just thrown out of bed. No. He says, I will deliver you from the mental strain and I will give you peace. Remember, we belong to God and He doesn't want to have us suffering continually. But then again, if it's a physical infirmity, there's nothing we can do if God does not want to cure it. Second Corinthians 12, remember Paul? Lord, please heal me. Three times. Heal my infirmity. We believe it was an eye defect. What did God say? You're healed, Paul, get up and walk away. No, God says, be as you are. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And what did Paul do? Did he go, oh, brother, i got to spend the rest of my life like this? No, he said, praise the Lord. I will glory in my infirmity. He will praise God for being sick. First Timothy 5.23, Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for his stomach's sake. He had a problem. Paul didn't just go on there and lay hands on him or pray for him and say, you're delivered. Timothy would be delivered in a sense of the relaxation of the spirit of the mind, but physically you'd still be sick. Second Timothy 4:20. Trophimus, have I left in Miletum sick? Come on, Paul, why are you leaving all these guys sick? Why don't you just go over there and heal them, Paul? Why don't you heal yourself? I heard a preacher in TV say Paul didn't have enough faith. Oh boy, wait till he meets Paul. Paul didn't have enough faith. Paul was a ground and pillar of faith, one who wrote many of the New Testament books, established upon Jesus Christ and the other apostles. You see what I'm trying to get at? Many today overemphasize the healing part. That's wrong. Because God does not necessarily have to heal us physically, but God will deliver us from the anguish of sickness. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up, and if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Notice, if he has committed sins, if. Third class condition clause in the Greek language, which means a hypothetical case. If he has, only if he has. In other words, it's not sickness that's a direct um, occurrence from the fact that the person has sinned. It could be sickness because sickness is prevalent on a sinful world. But listen, if he has sinned, they shall be forgiven him. But let's not forget one thing. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't leave out the little word he, because that's pointing to God himself. In other words, even though he says he shall be forgiven, it's not because the elders are there praying for the individual. It's because that person through the sickness might realize, hey, maybe there is sin in my life. And that's a good reason sometimes why God brings people down. Because there's sin in their life and they don't know it, so God's going to work on them through sickness. Let me just read one portion here. When Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, they had problems. Boy, they were abusing the Lord's table. They were just having big love feasts. And that isn't the way God wanted to have his table celebrated. And at the very close, he says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, or in an unworthy manner, like these guys were doing, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Many are weak. Why? Because they were living in a state of sin and not even worried about it. God says, oh, not only were they sick, he says they were asleep. That means dead. They were put to death because of what they had done. And then in verse 31, he says, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. You see that? If we should judge ourselves, we're not going to be judged by God. He's not going to chasten us for correction if we correct ourselves first. If he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. In other words, if the person is sick and it's because of sin, 
then obviously he's going to come to that point where with the leadership he's going to confide and he's going to and they're going to pray with him there is where we get to our little problem passage of verse 16 confess your faults one to another it's on well, we're running out of time here listen let me just get a, I'll give you a fast shot at verse 16. He says, confess your faults one to another. There's one little particle left out, and I'll tell you something. Don't leave out any little particles from the original language, and that's un, which means therefore. Therefore implies something previously stated is going to be concluded, right? I did this, therefore. Well, look it. He says, if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your faults one to another. That doesn't tell us we're, we're to go around confessing our sins one to another. Can you imagine, uh, so, so many people today have done that, group confession, where they sit around and tell everybody sins. Can you imagine the detrimental effects it would have on an individual? Excuse me, I lusted after your wife, or excuse me, this and that. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't like you, or I stole something from you, you never even knew it. What do you think the guy's going to do? We're human. <clears throat> you know, I forgive you all right, but I'm not going to trust you again. Listen, private sin requires private confession, right? Sins that we can't see. Sins that we do with the Lord, <laughs> He sees everything we do, but maybe somebody can't see the sins that I do. Private confession with Him. Public sin requires public confession. If you are harming the body of Christ, then confess it publicly to them. Go and see them, etc. But at this point, don't use this passage for an escape route that we can just start, you know, hey, let's uh, get together for about 20 minutes and confess our sins one to another, see who's got the best sins. No, that's not how it works. Therefore, is concluding from verse 15, confess your, and it's not false, it's hamartia, sins one to another and pray one for another. I believe that's referring to the elders and the person that could be sick because of sin. Confess it and get back into fellowship with God. Why? What's the end of verse 16 say? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That word effectual, fervent is from one Greek word, energeo, energetic. Powerful, persistent prayer, but you have to be righteous. If you're in sin, you're not righteous. So God says, confess to me and you will become righteous. In other words, at a standing where we can have fellowship again. Too many churches today have just misused these few portions of Scripture, and I don't have time to complete it. I wanted to get into Elijah, because, boy, if you want an example of prayer, you've got to see this man, Elijah. Because he prayed, and it says prayed earnestly, but that's really, literally, he prayed in prayer. Some people just pray. Well, I've got to say my prayers, you know, I'll give 30 seconds. Or some people say, you know, thank you, God, for the food, amen. But there's praying in prayer. It's the sphere of prayer. It's, it's being in an attitude of knowing exactly what prayer is. And is, that's the main intent of this passage of Scripture. It's prayer. Let's try to use it this week. Really. Try to use it. Try, just remember how powerful it is. The atomic bomb is pff, nothing compared, compared to the power of prayer. And let's not just pray, you know, two, three minutes. or I'm not saying we have to have a, a certain length of time. But let's pray earnestly, persistently to God and pray, well, just like he says to ask, if any lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, but let him, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Pray that way. Pray positively. Remember in 1 John 5, and this is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything, we can't stop there, according to his will. He hears, it, hears us, and whatsoever we ask, we have the petitions that we desire of him. That's how we should be praying. And if anybody gives you, uh, you know, like, if you have any problems with this passage, I just challenge you to come and talk with me or search it out yourself and see what you can get from it. Uh, because it has produced a lot of problems. But I'm sure that you can see how clear what James is really trying to state. First of all, in verse 13, if you're afflicted, pray. If you're sick, unable to get to the church, call for the elders and they'll pray with you. If you're in sin, question yourself, why am I sick? Is it just because I'm sick or is it because, wait, maybe sin's plaguing my life? Get back in fellowship so that you can be the effectual, uh, the person that can pray properly to God and get things done, just like Elijah did. He got things done because he was one who stayed in a good standing with God. Let's pray. Father, it is just uh, a real joy to have the freedom to look in your word and as we just look at the words of James as he wrote for you, and just to know that there is power in prayer. Our Father, we know that in this life, as we walk righteously with you, there's going to be times of affliction. There's going to be times of suffering. 
There might even be times of sickness. But our Father, let us draw close to you in prayer. And let us think of one another. Let us put you first, others second, and ourselves last. Let us decrease that you might increase. Let us put on the full armor of God to serve you properly. We thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for our fellowship. And we just thank you for being our God, not just an impersonal God, but one that is personal, one whom we can call Father because of the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Let us give praise and honor to you during the week. In Jesus' name we pray.